Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event today, Introduction to Teaching at a Community College. This is the first of our three-part series on exploring careers in teaching at community college. You'll hear a lot more about the series and more from those who are organizing this event in just a minute. For now, I want to welcome everyone to this online offering on behalf of the CERTL Network. My name is Kate Diamond, and I am here to help with any technical issues that might come up. So if you run into problems, you can't hear, you can't type in the chat window, let me know in the chat window, um, or send us an email at info at .net, and we'll troubleshoot whatever issues you are dealing with. Um, we find that a lot of people who attend our online programming aren't necessarily familiar with CERTL, so I want to talk briefly about who we are um, to help frame and orient today's event and this broader series a little bit. Um, we are the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning. We're a network of 37 universities in the U.S. and Canada working to make the sciences more diverse by changing how they're taught. That is the briefest, most succinct version of what we do. Um, a big part of how we achieve that goal is by teaching STEM grad students and postdocs about inclusive, evidence-based teaching and learning so that they can become both excellent researchers, which you're already getting the training to do, and excellent teachers since so many of you want to go on to pursue future faculty positions. Um, you can learn more about our member institutions, our approach to STEM education, and the full range of our programming at our website. Um, obviously, teaching at community colleges represents such a huge portion of um, students who pursue some type of higher education or advanced education. And so we're really excited to bring this three-part series to you. Um, with that, um, I just want to make one housekeeping note about being online today since we have so many people in the room. Um, we're going to ask that participants talk to us through the chat window. Feel free to chime in at any moment. We are also going to pause throughout the session today for a Q&A um, period. So um, there will be plenty of opportunities to check in. If you don't see a chat window already on your screen, you should see in the lower right hand corner a little icon that looks like that, go ahead and click that to expand the chat window. All right, with that, I will uh, wrap up my intro and hand things over to our event hosts, Jess Gregg and Katie Dixie from UCLA. All right, thank you so much, Kate. Um, so hi, everybody. Welcome to our event today. Um, just to start us off and get a little bit of a feel for who's in the room, we have a quick poll question. Um, so the question here is, why are you interested in joining us here today? And what, what brought you here? Are you definitely interested in community college? Are you interested but want to learn more? Maybe haven't thought about it, but looking into it. Or other. Um, and feel free to type in the chat box about that. And so if you're having trouble um, finding the poll, it should be down in your bottom um, part of your screen uh, with a little, it looks like a little polling icon. All right. So can we have a good mix here? Awesome. So we're seeing a lot of people who are interested but want to learn more, um, as well as people who actually are really, really want to apply for positions at community college and, and want to learn more about how to do that and what they should do. So um, here's kind of what we're seeing. It looks like a good mix of people, um, which is great. And then a, a second question is, do you know anyone who teaches at a community college? Um, I do know I'm someone for sure. Um, no, I don't know anyone, not sure, or maybe other. Wow, okay, a lot of people seem to know some people that teach there, that's great. Hopefully they can give you some advice. If you don't know them now, you're gonna learn from some of our panelists today for sure. Okay, great. So here's kind of a, a little bit of information about um, the breakdown of, of who may know people that teach there. And so maybe you've already heard a bit about the benefits, um, but we're going to learn some more from a couple different people today. So I might as well introduce myself. Um, my name is Katie Dixie. I am representing the NSF Includes um, Aspire Alliance, uh, specifically from the California Regional Collaborative. Um, but I'm based out of UCLA. And 
also have Jess Gregg, who is coming from our Center of Education, Innovation, and Learning and Sciences. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yes, I'm Jess. Hi, everybody. And of course, you already met Kate, who is our wonderful tech support person. So thank you, Kate, for, for um, being on the, on the call with us. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this series and, and what this webinar is part of. Um, this is actually a three-part series. So the first here is our introduction to teaching at community college, but we also have some other upcoming webinars, including getting hired at a community college, uh, which is coming up on the 27th, so for uh, February 27th. So for those of you really interested in applying, this is great to get a lot of tips and strategies about that. And then in March, we're having another one about diversity, equity, and inclusive teaching at community college. They will talk about in a bit how diverse um, the student population can be and how important this is to think about um, when considering this career. So this series really is focused to help um, participants learn a bit more about this great career option and um, learn a bit more about the diversity of the students really through hearing from panels of current and former faculty members at community college where they can share their experiences with you. So a little bit about Aspire and what we represent. Um, this is part of a national group or alliance for looking at trying to create more inclusive and diverse STEM faculty specifically. So this comes out of a problem across the United States of a lot of people starting out in STEM majors and then leaving um, either to other majors or uh, leaving the school altogether. And this is happening actually at disproportionate rates for students from underrepresented groups or um, from underserved populations compared to, for example, maybe white students. So there are a lot of different ways to kind of tackle this problem, but Aspire really works to help prepare STEM faculty to be more inclusive and effective in their teaching, especially when it comes to working with different populations of students. Um, we're also looking to try to diversify the faculty members. And so having recruitment and hiring of people who might be a perfect fit for this job but may not know much about it um, is something that we'd like to do, as well as try to change some institutional culture so that different institutions will really try to value a bit more how to um, teach more inclusive and, and fostering diversity on their campuses. Now, there's a lot of different arms that are involved in Aspire. I'm, we are representing today um, the regional collaborative aspect, so we're looking at regional change. Again, I'm from California Regional Collaborative, but we have two others, one in Iowa and one in Texas. And really, we have kind of two main goals. The first being working with future faculty, so graduate students and postdocs, um, and really try to recruit people and, and increase and get the word out there about this career option. And a lot of what we do in this as well is to really strengthen their preparation for teaching at community college because it is a different um, atmosphere. And we also work with current faculty to try and teach them um, different methods that could be used in the classroom, especially evidence-based methods that CERTA loves to teach. So, um, again, we do a lot of this through internships, um, providing internships, putting on workshops like this and webinars, as well as training and other inform um, informational sessions. So, again, before we get started here, a little bit of a question. What is community college and how is that different from a four-year institution? So, from a typical four-year college or university, community colleges tend to have a very specific type of learning environment where you have smaller class sizes, which allow for more individualized attention and more support. And so, for these different populations of students at community college, there tends to be um, a bit more support and equity-based programs that can be there to help um, nurture students as they go through the programs. Um, another thing about community college is it's really there to be kind of a public open access um, source to education. And so some people go there to prepare themselves to transfer to four-year schools, but not everybody. A lot of people, there's a lot of associate degrees and certificate programs that people participate in, as well as kind of one-off courses, for example, um, some things like 
uh, learning English as a second language. And so these are things that really benefit the community. They're very community focused and students often, often go to ones that are close to home um, so they don't have to move. And the cost for attending community college is generally much cheaper, about $3,000 in tuition per semester compared to the national average of 10,000 at a four-year institution. And with um, a lot of support, actually there, there can be about $400 per student full-time per semester. And so depending on the grants available to the students, um, it's much more affordable. And I'd also like to point out there are a lot of students that go through um, and are enrolled in community colleges, about 5 million across the United States in fall of 2019. So that's quite a lot that are participating here. So this is a great population to reach, especially when we're talking about um, keeping people in STEM or just even not just STEM, but in education in general. So a little bit about the diversity at community colleges. As I mentioned, they tend to be a bit more diverse than four-year institutions, and so we're looking at different populations. Um, about half of African-American students, so all of the African-American students in the country, about half of them get their start at community college or um, are at community college, and that is true also for Hispanic students compared to about a third of white or Asian students in the United States. So really we're having um, a lot of these underserved or underrepresented populations start out at community college. So with that, uh, you're probably tired of hearing from me. Let's hear from the experts here. So I'm gonna have the panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about where they're from, and a little bit of why they got interested in teaching at community college in the first place. And we start with Dale. Hello, this is, uh, I am Dale Fields, as noted, uh, pronouns they, they, them. And I'm at, uh, this is uh, Los Angeles Pierce College, part of the largest community college district in the country. And when I was a graduate student, this is, I became interested in the community college, this is a career for two main reasons. Uh, the uh, this is uh, one that from a skill percent perspective is that I had taught at a four year and I didn't really feel I could uh, this is reach students uh, this is very effectively with a large class size. And the fact is that for a lot of students at four years are already got the skills they need to succeed all throughout college. So having a good skill as a teacher wouldn't really matter very much to me. And so I saw a community college as his career as one where I could actually make a difference, where becoming more skilled would actually says, be helpful. The second aspect ultimately is personality type, and I really wanted a stable job, a stable environment. I mean, going to like postdocs scared me. I mean, moving all over the place, back and forth. This is it was. I didn't. I wanted something stable and continuous in my life, and so a community college was absolutely a perfect match for me. Thank you, Dale. Um, so, how about Kathy? Hi there. And, you know, it's funny, I, I had recently retired after 22 years. I had a career before teaching and in different kinds of industries. I moved to the Northwest to follow my husband out here and had a child and got uh, pregnant with a second child, stayed home for a couple of years and decided that staying home um, full time was really not the best thing for my sanity. So. I went to a seminar and ran into uh, someone who was a department chair at a local community college, and she's now one of my dear friends, and she invited me to teach a lab. And I said, I don't want, want to teach. I never wanted to teach. Well, I got to tell you, she supported me greatly, and from day one, I was absolutely hooked. I spent four or five years as a part-time instructor when I was uh, able to finally take advantage of an opportunity that opened up in Portland, and I got a full-time job then. And it's the best thing I ever did. Great, thank you. And how about Lonnie? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I am, uh, gosh, this is my 20th year teaching at Mount San Antonio College. That's in East LA County. We are the largest single campus district, I think, in the state for sure, uh, possibly in the whole nation, because we have up to 50,000 students. Um, my 
career tra uh, transitions kind of in a different way. My background is, is medicine. I went to medical school, finished. And when I started doing residency, I realized, you know, just like back in undergrad, I like to tutor. I like to teach. And the best part is, is just talking to patient about, you know, how to take better care of their health. So then I decided to take a part-time class um, in teaching uh, at a community college. And it really suits my personality, my needs. And from that point on, I just continue on, move from a part-time to a full-time position. And here I am, 20 years later, I'm still teaching uh, anatomy, physiology, health, general bio. Great, thank you. So you can see here we have kind of a, a diverse range of um, faculty that can hopefully give us some great insight on what it means to teach at community college. So I'm going to start with um, a couple questions. And so we have kind of, it's separated into three different parts. So at first we're going to talk about equity and diversity at community college. Then we'll go into faculty duties and life um, as a third option. So while we are going through these questions, we have a few prepared ones. Please post comments for any additional questions you might have because we'll have sessions or sections where we can um, answer some of the, this, the panel or the participant questions. So to start off, um, I think the sense maybe Lonnie can talk to is, um, can you speak about the diversity of the population at your college and why it's different maybe from ones that you've experienced at your four year in the university or even maybe in medical school? I have had students anywhere from high school, you know, minors. I kind of learned it the hard way because at the time I was teaching human sexuality and I didn't realize that I had minors in the class. So when we had a field trip to a sex shop, um, I got complaints from the parents saying, hey, what are you doing taking my student, you know, my kid who's under 18? And uh, so anyway, I learned the hard way that, yeah, there are a lot of, you know, younger age minors in our class possibly. Uh, and then of course I've had people in their 50s who are either taking classes for just because they want to know or possibly even a career change. So I have, you know, very mature adults, um, families, you know, with kids, and they have mortgage and they have bills and they are working job, full-time jobs and taking my classes at night. So, uh, so it's a huge diversity in terms of um, age, in terms of preparation, uh, maturity level. Uh, course, ethnic background, uh, Mount Sac, we are predominantly a Hispanic serving institution. Majority of our students are Hispanics. And then the second population after that would be Asians and Pacific Islanders. And then the third population would be white and then um, African American. Um, and of course, you know, we have people who are first generation. And so they really uh, need a lot of guidance. And then there are other students who are actually doing quite well They're in the honors program, and their parents have, you know, been college grad, so they they know the system very well. Um, so I just, you know, I have to say, compared to say a four-year institution, um, I, we definitely have way more diversity, and, and that creates a challenge uh, in the classroom for the the instructor, because we somehow have to connect with as many students as possible. And that's not always easy. Definitely. Thank you so much, Lenny. Um, would any of the other panelists like to jump in and add anything? If not, we'll move on to our next question. I think Lonnie summed it up. Great. <laughs> um, so actually, Kathy, this question is maybe for you. What are some efforts that your institution is taking to kind of promote the success of different students, especially from underrepresented groups? Um, and what are they doing to encourage this, the retention of students in STEM as opposed to um, having them leave at a... Concerted effort to get instructors um, to match our students. We are doing uh, seminars, um, weekly chats, uh, faculty development, um, you know, just uh, a lot of that sort of thing. But for students themselves, we have a tutor center that's a peer tutor center that I think has been the number one um, way to keep our, uh, all of our students, but particularly the 
uh, URG students in school because our peers look like our students and they talk to them and they talk to them on a level that you know they can a student can go to the, the tutor center and ask them a question and not be embarrassed when they ask the teachers even though we sit and hold office hours there too um, I think sometimes my students might choose to go at a time that I'm not there so they don't have to feel embarrassed in front of me that they didn't really quite know it yet so there's a lot of there's a lot of activity on campuses these days trying to, uh, you know, really reach arms out and hang on. Great, thank you. It sounds like great initiatives to have on campus for sure. Um, so Dale, kind of continuing along that vein, um, Maybe you can speak to how the diversity of the faculty um, maybe match the diversity of the student population or not. And if not, what kind of impact do you think this might have on your students? Well, one thing that I think pretty clearly uh, demonstrates what's going on is when I first walked into our it's, it's, uh, physics room, uh, it says at uh, Pierce is that they had the big posters on the wall of all of these famous uh, it's physicists and every single one of them was a white male and I just thought about you know what would I feel like if I came into this classroom and saw that and so overall this is representation is a big challenge and I think we've really worked on like diversifying my uh, own department in terms of like gender uh, it says uh, but we're all still white. And so one of the big things is, is that we do have, as noted, this is a very predominant, this is, a, this is a underrepresented populations coming to our community colleges, especially in our STEM departments. And the instructors do not match this is a, that diversity. And so it says it is really an impact because I talk to a lot of students. Actually, it says in this case, um, predominantly, it says my equity focus is on women in STEM. And every single one of them has imposter syndrome. Every single one of them doesn't feel like they belong in the it's, it's a program. And so it says it's really tough to convince people to stick around. It says when they don't have a representation that someone like them can make it. Yeah. So um, Katie, if I can jump in here, there's a lot of uh, questions coming up in the chat. So I just want to make a, a comment here for um, our, our audience. Uh, we're really excited to answer all your questions. There are going to be um, you know, different topics that the panelists are, are speaking to. So it would be great to keep your questions focused on the, the topics that they're talking about uh, at this time. And then we can open it up towards the end. So if you have an unrelated question, maybe just uh, write that down. Um, on a piece of paper, and then and then we can um, have time at the end towards uh, to to address additional questions. Dale, you just spoke to this a little bit, but there was a question about the diversity of the community college. How does it compare to the diversity of the actual community around um, the community college? Can you uh, respond to that question? Well, this is as noted. It's not uh, it's as, as diverse. This is, uh, again, uh, Pierce College is a Hispanic-serving institution, and our Latinx is instructors uh, make up a lot smaller percentage this is of our population. And so it's, it's, it is, it's, it's difficult. This is to, it's, it's when you have that uh, difference in this is instructors versus community, especially because we're trying to reach out to the community. And so this is one of the big reasons why we have to focus on hiring and what can we do to actually get this is a, this is a more diverse faculty into uh, this is our institutions. Thank you. And um, maybe Kathy, you can speak to this question. There was two questions that I think are a little bit similar. One is, um, it was mentioned about kind of the type of personality that would uh, be suited for teaching at a community college. So maybe speaking a little more to what that means. Um, and then also there's a question about work-life balance at a community college versus teaching at a, a four-year institution. I think those two might be related, but what are some of the kind of uh, institutional cultural differences between teaching at a community college versus a four-year institution and why might somebody prefer one over the other? Oh, 
Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I guess I can, I can address all of those and tell me if I don't. So I think that my work-life balance is, has been a little off balance because um, I, I, I tend to give a little too much and work a little too much. So it's really important as a faculty person to manage that time, just like we try to help our students to manage their time to make sure that they're not studying. Most of our students work at least half time to full time and then come to school. So they're working, going to school, taking care of kids, just like I am. So when I give my students advice to kind of relax, have some time with their family, some downtime, hey, today's a holiday. Take the day off and honor Martin Luther King, for example. And don't work today, you know, do some volunteer work or whatever. And let your mind sort of relax. As a faculty person, you have to do that too, because my experience has been those of us in the community college level teach because we're incredibly passionate about it. We can see very directly the difference we make with the students in our classes, the students that we see going on to nursing schools or medical schools or four-year institutions and become very successful. So we get really excited about that and, and that's, we tend to overwork. So finding that work-life balance is, is very true and learning to say no once in a while is something I've not gotten very good at yet even in my retirement. I'm still teaching one class online and doing this kind of thing because I really believe that it's we in the community college who really can make a difference um, with helping our students realize that they're not imposters, like Dale was saying, that they can do it. I guess the personality I think of my colleague, um, my you know much loved colleague and I, we were um, we got A's, but we weren't that straight A type A driven student. We failed. We made mistakes along the way. And so we really understand that students, they can fail. They can make those mistakes. We can guide them through picking up, starting over, and doing it again and becoming successful. And to watch somebody go, in my mind, from a struggling D student to finishing the term with a B with confidence, I think that's just that's huge. It's, it's as successful as seeing somebody graduate, you know, with a 4-0. So I, did I answer the question in, in all of them? I think so. And I'm realizing we also are going to have some other questions related to faculty life coming up. So um, okay. can I add to that, Jess? I'm sorry. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I just want to make a distinction. Um, at the community college, uh, there's a huge difference between a full-time faculty member versus an adjunct faculty member. Um, for example, when we select classes uh, for the upcoming semester, and we usually do this a year in advance, um, full-time faculty member gets their first pick of whatever classes they want. Uh, and for us, um, a full load, a, a full-time full load is five classes per semester. Once we do that, whatever is left over will then be assigned to our part-timers or adjuncts. So um, for a, a, an adjunct, you know, the job security may not be there because we only hire uh, classes that we need to be filled once our full-time faculty are done selecting their classes. Um, so that, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, that means a lot of our part-timers are what we call freeway flyers. They go from campus to campus uh, just so that they have classes to keep, you know, to, to make their their uh, payment, their, their mortgage payment. So I think the lifestyle for an adjunct faculty member at a community college could be very rough because number one, there's no job security. And number two, um, you know, you just have to take what you can get sometimes. And it doesn't always work out with your schedule as you try to you know, plan what class to teach where, and then make sure you have time to commute, because as you know, the Southern California traffic is, could be bad. Now, compared yes. to, yeah, compared to a four-year institution, um, you know, I think the pressure there is to publish, to write for grants, to, to do research, and none of that is there at the community college. Thanks, Lonnie. Thank 
Yeah, I'm going to hand it back over to Katie to keep going. I am noting some of the other questions, um, but I'll, I'll bring them up in the relevant section and or at the end if we haven't gotten to them yet. Great. Um, actually, Lonnie, that was the perfect transition because our first question uh, regarding to faculty duties um, is, you know, uh, What's the difference between full and part-time faculty, especially in regards to their duties? And what are some expectations of these different um, types of faculty at your institution? So Lonnie, if you'd like to speak more, um, or maybe Dale could speak a bit more on, on this uh, topic. Okay, so um, at our school, for a full-time, we have to have five classes. Um, I mentioned that before. and. It could be the same five classes, could be different five classes, because we select what class we want to teach and when we want to teach these classes. In addition, we have uh, committee work to do, so we have to serve on campus committee. It could be within our department. It could be outside our department on somewhere on campus. Um, we are required at the end of the year to submit uh, a report as to how we spend our time outside of class. Uh, for for uh, uh, professional development, for example, and, and where you know what kind of committee work we have served on for that academic year. Um, in addition, we are required to hold office hours, and I believe for us it is four hours per week. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that pretty much sums it up for our required full time. Now, for us, full time means only teaching in the um, fall semester and the spring semester. Summer and winter intercessions are uh, what we consider overload or extra pay, um, you know, so it's not uh, required, it's not mandatory. Uh, if we do teach it, then we get paid extra. Um, as for part-time instructor, uh, I believe at our campus, the maximum that they can be assigned is three classes per semester. Um, and uh, we just recently been able to offer our part-time faculty members um, some type of health insurance, but before that, it was not the case. And uh, they are required to do less office hours because, um, of course, they're teaching less classes. Um, Part-timers are not required to do any kind of committee work. Uh, they don't have to serve uh, unless they want to. Uh, they don't have to attend department meetings unless they want to. So there's a lot of optional uh, uh, service there. Uh, and of course, if they do volunteer, then they exactly that is volunteer. They don't get any kind of compensation, at least at our campus. Dale, you want to add? Yes, so the experience that I've had is very much the same. Uh, but one of the things that we should add is that it says, at least for ours, it says we it says, uh, have seen what we call seniority lists. And this is sort of a, let's call it a partial tenure for it says uh, predominantly our uh, part-time faculty. So once you it says, have taught for a certain time, it says for us, then you earn a place on this seniority list. And then if there are extra classes available, they have to go to the people on this list. And so we have had people who are part-time instructors, who have been part-time instructors for us for years. It's, it's actually a, it's a de de more than a decade in uh, several cases. And so people, it does add some amount of job security in terms of our part-time faculty. The life of a part-time faculty and adjunct faculty is still more uncertain than a full-time, though it says uh, if you live in a union state, then the unions will typically actually, it says, push for more protections for that. One example in California being that we actually are required to have a certain percentage of full-time faculty. I've noticed a couple of question, statements about how it's cheaper to hire part-time than full-time, and yes, but since the, uh, since with the pushing of uh, unions, for example, uh, we're actually required to hire more full-time faculty, and that typically does come from our part-time pool. And says, uh, but otherwise, just wanted to echo it says the other things that Lonnie has been saying. Thank you. Um, so what I'm hearing is that it really kind of depends on, on what you want to get out of it. Also, because um, I know there are some people that, that choose to go part-time um, on purpose, because there are benefits um, to both, I think, depending on what you want to do. 
Um, so moving to the next question here, um, maybe Dale and Kathy, uh, what do you appreciate the most about teaching at a community college and what's most challenging for you or have you found? Um, Dale, I'll jump in. Um, the students and the students. <laughs> and, and I mean that um, with my heart. I mean, the most challenging thing is we have a very wide range of students. We have excellent, excellent students. Now, I teach chemistry, and most students are terrified of coming in. And everybody has a, a, a range of how much chemistry they maybe had in high school that may have been more than 10 years ago. So we do try to teach it from the start. Um, and that can also be challenging because the students that are a little more advanced might get a little bored a little sooner and get frustrated. And, um, you know, I do the same thing you did at the start. Please write down your questions and we'll talk about them. And then we try to do an, um, student centered classrooms where we'll do a lot of group work. And that can be very challenging to get those little more advanced students willing to work with students who are struggling. And sometimes they struggle because they had to go home after class the day before and work six hours and then go home and be up half the night with a, a sick child. So they came into the class maybe a little underprepared and trying to make sure that other students don't get irritated or frustrated with that and continue to move forward uh, where we want to be every day. So those are just some of the challenges, but of course they come with the same rewards that I talked about earlier. Dale? Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, once again, uh, this is uh, I'd like to echo a lot of things. This is uh, especially students, students, uh, that I love being able to it says, make that difference where it says I can potentially change the path of uh, some people. Science literacy is incredibly important to me. And so the chance to actually reach a greater portion of the community and try to get more it says, people in the United States to make evidence-based decisions is a really big deal it says, uh, to me. And so I love getting the chance to see all these students. And that's going to link into the challenging part because this is equity, getting in people into science that traditionally have not been there. Because I'm, I have a firm belief that this is we are stronger together. You know, like a biological population is stronger the more genetic diversity it has. And the same thing is true, I, this is ideologically and this is uh, culturally. So I want, we need to get more people, it says, from underrepresented groups in, and I love that I can do that in a community college. I don't just have this upper crust, it says, uh, it says high socioeconomic status, uh, it says white straight population coming in. I've got people coming in from all these different cats. And that's challenging because uh, it says finding ways of pre making your material relevant to different people with different background assumptions and coming in with different levels of preparation is really tough because you have to constantly adjust to the level of the room, as we say. You have to always be working on what kind of it's, it's a rephrasing you want to do to try to get these things across, to reach out. And so I am constantly working. I am constantly improving. And that's also a really fun thing that I need to con be on my toes. I can't just let it slide and to show up for work every day. And so all that's tied together. I love that challenge and that whole, um, this is uh, Robert F. Kennedy, this is uh, John F. Kennedy, it says we go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it is hard. And that's a wonderful thing to do a hard job and uh, be able to do it well. Great, thank you. Um, so definitely student-centered, it sounds here, um, for both. Uh, so. Maybe um, Lonnie, you can speak on this, and maybe Kathy also, since you've had um, some other positions. What's something you thought maybe was true about teaching at community college and ended up not being that? So are there any myths out there you want to try to debunk or, or kind of dissuade people from thinking? Um, I think uh, a lot of people think that classes at community college are watered down and uh, you know it may not be taught well. Actually, I find that to be not true because my colleagues are, are excellent 
teachers. Um, they can really um, do their job well. The students love their classes, they get high ratings, um, and they get the message across. Um, so if anything, you know, teaching at community college uh, is, is, has its rigor, um, and to meet the challenge of the diverse uh, student population, you know, that, that's what keeps us on our toes. You, know, you really can't afford to do the same old, same old all the time because um, that's not going to help students succeed. Um, so, uh, so I don't, you know, I used to think, yeah, teaching at community college may be easy because it's lower division classes, really basic stuff. Um, but yet, uh, because of the student population diversity, and uh, you know, just just keeping things that are relevant and connecting the content to the different students in their lives, that makes it very challenging and exciting at the same time. You know. So. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Ani, and we. I guess my I get very frustrated when I you know kind of get a little dissed a little bit at four year at, at like the ACS convention and four year people and they're doing all this stuff and they just think oh you you teach at the junior college or at the community college and they get they think like you're just not as important um, but we know we are and we know we make a real difference with our students and our students are not stupid. Our students are extremely smart and very busy, and they are really trying to change their lives. And many of them are paying for it themselves, or you know what the state isn't supporting, they're paying for on their own or with some grants. But um, students struggle. It is challenging. It's not easy, and it's not watered down in any way. So yeah, it's it's a great place to start. I would say many, many students who don't want to spend the money on a four-year institution come to a two-year school, you know, get some one-on-one -on -one teaching and then move on uh, to that four-year institution. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I think now we have some uh, time for some more participant questions. Just do you want to lead us up on that? Sure. Um, so there's a couple of questions that have come up um, about like the competitiveness of getting a full time job um, and how likely it is to get a full time job. Do you have to have a Ph.D.? So um, I know I, I imagine all of you maybe have served on hiring panels. I know for sure that um, Lonnie has. So Lonnie, maybe you can speak uh, to this question if people are concerned that uh, about the competitiveness of getting a full-time job, you know, do you have to start as an adjunct? Are there ways? And and one thing I noted is that it probably varies by region, <laughs> um, but maybe you can speak to that. Yes. Uh, in terms of competitiveness, it really depends on the uh, specific discipline. Uh, for example, in biology, um, we currently have a position for microbiology. Uh, instructor. We did this last year and was not able to fill uh, because we just didn't have enough applications. Um, so we're applying it again this year. Now on the reverse, last year I served on the hiring committee for a general biology uh, full-time position and we had I think over a hundred applications and then um, human resources went through and pretty much took out all the the ones that did not meet minimum qualification. And with that leftover, we had about 80 applications that we had to screen. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's, it depends on the specific position. General biology, we had a lot. Microbiology, we had very little. And I don't remember if there's another part to that question. Um, there are there's some questions about do people have to have a PhD? Maybe I know that there there is some language and some terminology and some information about this idea of minimum qualifications. Can you clarify what that means? Like what and then how that might affect compensation as well? That question came up. Uh, yes, uh, on the 
uh, call for the application, there should be a section that, you know, with the heading minimum qualification. I would recommend that the applicant fulfill that perfectly because if you don't meet one or more of those minimum qual, um, your application will probably not even be reviewed. Uh, so for us at MAUSAC, um, the uh, professional uh, training, the minimum we require is a master degree. And uh, we often like experience in teaching. So uh, teaching part-time is something that we definitely want because it shows that uh, the applicant is aware of, of what it's like to teach at a community college and has had experience, you know, firsthand experience so that they can build upon that. Um, and of course, you know, with the, uh, the part of the interview process, uh, the applicant will have to demonstrate their ability to teach. So, uh, so all of that kind of goes hand in hand um, in terms of uh, part-time teaching experience is a definite big plus. And I would say, probably mandatory because I can't imagine trying to get a full-time teaching job without having even stepped foot in a classroom at a community college. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to echo that because I see um, there's a, another conversation happening in the chat about this as well, whether you, whether or not you need teaching experience. And I think from what we've learned through our programming, um, it definitely, I mean, especially in Southern California where it's extremely competitive is a really important um, part of your of your application to be competitive. So we want to um, help people understand different ways that they can get some experience around that. Um, I also want to echo what Kate Diamond uh, put the little link in there that the next event in the series, the webinar that we're doing is specifically on getting hired. So that will really get more into the nuts and bolts of that. Um, so I want to move, be able to move forward um, with questions that are more, more about kind of the introduction to what it's like to be uh, a community college faculty member today and, and keep the focus on that a little bit more. So we're hoping that people will definitely join for the next event specifically about hiring as well. Uh, one last question before we get, get back to Katie and our next uh, slide. Uh, there was a question about like what, what's a typical work week like? And I know a lot of people are attracted to community colleges. You, you often get the summers off. Um, can somebody speak to that? Maybe um, Kathy? I can't remember when I've had a summer off. Um, but on the other hand, I can pick and choose my classes. Um, like I said, when my children were small, I chose to teach evening classes in the summer and earn a little extra money. And um, I would be grading papers where they would be playing in the yard. And there was often sticky stuff on their labs when I was grading them. But you know, um, yeah, working in the summer is, is, is a choice. And I have friends who don't work in the summer. They choose not to. And they do all kinds of wonderful travel. So it's all, all, that all depends on um, what you really want and what you need from, from the field. It's not usually required um, or even pressured in your, in your department. What else was there, Jess, you wanted me to address? Um, just like a typical work week, what that would look like. Dale, maybe you want to speak to that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Dale. Yeah, so I mean, it's we can talk about the official versus the unofficial. So, like it says, uh, Lonnie thinks says I have a it says in general a 15-hour commitment to says in the Los Angeles Community College District, and added to that five and a half hours worth of it says a um, it says uh, office hours. It says uh, added on, and when you throw in a little bit of committee work and so forth, it officially gets to be about. 23-ish hours or so per week, technically. Um, unofficially, one of the things to know is that there are no TAs. There, are, it says there are no. It says uh, people to help a grade and so forth. It says the job at a community college is to teach, and so I do all my own grading. Now, usually that's on my couch. It says at home and so forth. It says with like music on or my cat nearby. You know, it says it's a. It says it is more flexible in terms of how exactly we. Uh, it says take care of this. Um, it says a lot of people do. It says extra work. I mean, the people that I know, since we have this shared governance, are on multiple committees that meet during the course of a week. Um, we'll see a little bit further on. This is with student life and so forth. People are advisors. It says for different clubs. And it says that are run. 
And so it says, overall, I would say my time that I spend at it says Pierce is, uh, it says each week, runs to the 40 or so hours, maybe it's 35 sometimes, but I will tell you there's about somewhere between 10 and 15 hours outside that I spend on grading and classroom prep and doing the extra little things. And this is, as noted, just a quick, I do not teach during the summer or the winter. This is, I do teach extra during fall and spring. So I actually have additional time that I spend, this is on top of that. But the flexibility in my schedule means that I could if I wanted to. Uh, and we do have a faculty member who wants to teach just the contract load. Um, it says it would be about the, this is 40 to, 50, to maybe 50 hours when you add in all the different grading. Awesome. Thank you all. So I'm actually going to skip to one question and then we'll come back to the other one. Um, since you brought up mentoring and advising, Dale, do you want to talk a little bit more about your experience providing the support to students um, as a mentor or advisor? I, or have sure. you had that experience? I, I have. Um, I've been a club advisor, both astronomy club. We've had a STEM club. It says I'm also the been the advisor for our queer students. It says a club. It says at Pierce College, and so there's a lot of extra work to be doing. So as noted. We get a lot of students coming in that are not fully prepared, and we want to get them more engaged. We want to show them why this is still fun when they're uh, cycling through their classes and trying to bring themselves uh, to a uh, level that would be successful throughout colleges. So um, a lot of the times there is a lot of unofficial uh, this is mentoring. Um, I notice our faculty members, myself included, tend to adopt some students and sort of uh, just help them out and sort of bring them along. Um, we do, it says, I know there's an earlier question about like research and so forth, and we don't do research uh, directly, but one of the things that I use as a form of advising and mentoring is that we have independent study opportunities. Now, we faculty are not actually paid for these. Um, it's as uh, kinds of independent studies, but it is it just uh, to teach students a little bit more research methods and to work on them it says, and get them a little bit of experience as to what science is like. Give them a chance, you know, not being a student, but being a scientist. What's the kind of thing that is? And so a lot of uh, faculty members actually step up and uh, says want to do it says these kinds of independent study students with the uh, ones that they think it says are going to be able. So we can uh, so that's a lot of the things that we do in terms of advisory mentoring. It says more directly. Hey, thank you. Um, so I'm going to skip back then to the to the previous question. Um, maybe Lonnie or Kathy or even Dale, we'll see. Um, what kind of support did you need when you first started um, at community college? Uh, was it an easy transition? What was available to you? Um, did you have to go and, and seek out support, or did they provide some stuff for you? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start, if that's OK. Um, so at MALSEC, we have a new faculty orientation that occurs every other Friday, and it goes for the entire first year um, that uh, the person is there full time. Um, I can't say enough about that orientation. It gives you pretty much all the basics that, uh, that you need to know uh, to really pretty much thrive in that uh, setting. And then, of course, we have our colleagues in the department that um, we can you know, ask and, and uh, talk to regarding their experience. So, um, so I think our campus does an excellent job of supporting new faculty. Yeah, I'd like to, to totally support that because when I started, I had a, um, the you know, department chair at my little my, my local college near me provide me with everything I needed, and I went and took that information to my new full time position at a new school. I didn't know anyone. And I was the only chemist on my campus, so I had to start the program, you know, pretty much from scratch. It was a wonderful experience. So everybody I hired, adjunct or full time, had given them all of my information, syllabi, uh, powerpoints. Well, I didn't have powerpoints to start with. Um, when Kenny, who I hired ten years in, 
he came in and he spent his first three years developing his PowerPoints, gave them to me, and then I just edited them. <laughs> and so, you know, PowerPoint wasn't popular when I was well, wasn't around when I started teaching. It was chalkboard. So, it's it's getting everything you need. And then, in addition, I know this is gonna sound crazy. My, I, I felt like an imposter, Dale. I, I know what they say. So here I am standing in front of a classroom. I've got to teach people. I have experience in working in different kinds of industries. I have a master's degree in organic chemistry. I know this stuff. But what about the basics? So before I go into class, you know, that term, I would do every single homework problem at the end of the chapter, like, and write it all out, have all, all my notes with me, and I'd go in. Boy, those first three years were a little rough, but after doing the same question over and over, by the time I got to my third year, I was pretty darn confident that I could pretty, pretty much answer all their questions or at least say, I'll get back to you. So it's a lot of initiative, reaching out to colleagues and then going to all the professional development you can, particularly in terms of, of and, you know, it, you know, um, teaching to URGs, you know, teaching to everybody and not just to the people who look like you. Yeah, if I'd like to jump in and actually very much support a lot of it, this is what Kathy said, because that's very much me. It says, I'm it says, an introvert scientist. What business do I have standing in front of the classroom? And the culture that I came from in graduate school was very dismissive of the practice of education. I had zero formal it says, uh, education in education while I was in graduate school. So I come into a community college and people are telling me there's this thing called a rubric and I'm a little scared to ask what this term rubric means. I mean, that's the kind of level of preparation that I really got so it's through this. Once you know your material, then you'll be able to teach it and students will sort themselves out. You know, those kinds of myths that we hold that say that teaching doesn't really matter. And since that's the graduate student, uh, it's this experience that I really had. Teaching is something that you do when you don't, are not working on a research project. You know, that kind of uh, it's his attitude. And so I came in and I really just uh, busted my ass to find more uh, supportive pedagogy, to find out how to be a better teacher, how to gain those skills. And so that professional development opportunities for like Sertal, it says, uh, for example, is something that I just devoured. It says, uh, it says when I to make sure that I could be a skillful and uh, beneficial. It says help to it says my students. Thank you. Um, so, Dale, actually, I want to start with you on this next question. Oops. Um, so beyond the classrooms, you kind of mentioned that you do some advising, um, but I know you're also involved with the LA Community College District on some initiatives. What's your experience with campus culture, or not necessarily campus life, but also um, beyond the classroom? What kind of things do you do? And then maybe uh, Lonnie or Kathy could jump in after. Sure. So this is one of the great things I actually think about a community college position is that it does allow you to it gives you a springboard to go and deal with some of the main issues that you have uh, that you care about. And so the community campus culture it says is generally pretty happy if people step up it says, and want to do things. Uh, it says we actually are really is uh, have a very vibrant faculty life much to sometimes our administrators dismay um, because we're a bunch of you know, cats it says, uh, and getting us to go in a particular direction is hard and so there's all these different voices going on and so people are want to know what else uh, they can do or people want to form communities and it says, so getting out there and getting to promote and support different things is really it's something that you can do this is by just force of effort and just going in and talking to other people and this is uh, my this is we got a big pedagogy group coming together, a community of practice, because I just went around to different departments and said, hey, do you have uh, you know, 15 minutes at your department meeting that I could speak uh, this is during? And it says, uh, or it says when we wanted to deal with some of the issues affecting our queer students. 
is that says we talked around uh, it says just uh, got contact num names and so forth and just pushed into talking to various administrators both at our local college and in our overall district and uh, it says I was happy to find out it says uh, when I got formed and was tapped because they knew it says that I was asking these questions to serve on this advisory group that actually advises on LGBTQ it says, issues for our entire community college district so you can really design your own life and it says, uh, it says once you get there I mean I emphasize the main thing is my teaching but you can really do and work on to say, issues that are important to you, whether that's equity issues, whether that's making sure we have the technology in the classrooms to support us ourselves. Some of our faculty are very involved in that and spend their that majority of time doing that. Or they're working on connections with the community. So all of this is really what do you want to make a difference in? And it says, I think the community college offers that flexibility to go do that. Um, I just want to add that, you know, when I first started teaching, I pretty much focused on the classroom and teaching. Now I've come to learn that uh, it's very, uh, it should be a comprehensive effort with the entire campus community. So I have reached out and I have volunteered to be on various committees, especially those that uh, has to do with student services, because it's not just about what we do in the classroom that help a student succeed, but it's also about referring students to the various services on campus. For example, we have tutorial, uh, we have the Dream Center, we have uh, the uh, Veterans uh, Resource Center, we have financial aid, we have our homeless and basic need, so that if a student is hungry, or homeless or is you know um, have some kind of financial difficulty uh, we have resources that we can refer students to so um, i would just recommend that uh, you know yes you you focus on teaching but understand that uh, the student in front of you may need other resources that you cannot fulfill so it's best to know what is on your campus so that Alani, I think you cut out a little bit. By saying, is it? It looks like Lonnie is having a bit of a yeah. connection issue right now. So I would move on to another speaker who can contribute. Um, um, can, can I jump yeah. in here? Sure. There's a little feedback. Okay, there's a related question um, kind of about beyond the, the, the teaching responsibilities. If people are interested in doing research, um, is there opportunity to do that? I know it's not the main part of their job or necessarily what they're evaluated on, but is there opportunity to do that? Not usually. It depends on the research. You know, like in chemistry, you're going to need a lab with all the equipment. So finding a space to do that kind of research, you might want to collaborate with, um, you know, a four year institution nearby you um, to be able to do that. What I have found that has been really fun, and I'm sure both Lonnie and Dale have done this, is undergraduate research. Get smaller projects for students to work on. And you can be amazed how um, satisfying that can be. And I, I, I do know that um, in our region that there have been some efforts. There's a lot of opportunities for grant, grant funding related to research and related to education research, which is really looking at um, the best way to, or evidence-based practices or identifying what those practices are for teaching yeah, and engaging students. Yeah. yeah, and so those opportunities, often it is in collaboration with a four-year institution. Um, so it's a, it seems like, it's not the priority, it's not the focus. If that's the main thing you want to be doing, this might not be the best fit for you. But if it's something that you're really passionate about kind of doing on the side, that there are others here and there that are interested in it, um, that, that there would be some opportunity. Uh, but please let me know if I'm wrong. <laughs> Dale, I don't know if you have anything to add, add to that. 
that's uh, that's got it. I mean, the only times that I've done like research has been in the summer and the winter. It's as off and away. It's as working with other previous colleagues and so forth. Uh, so it says it is, you know, the focus is seems to be on the, the it's his education. Uh, but it says I love working with my students in their little research projects. I mean, one of my students found an exo moon. So not just a planet going around another star, but looking at the data and actually teasing out that one of these planets had a moon on it. And that was just so Ooh. amazing to see that stuff being done by one of my students and just seeing them it says they get through all that and um, trying not to uh, squeak too hard. It says when they it says brought back results. And so it says, uh, I do think collaborations and research is a wonderful thing with that. And again, also big support to uh, it says, uh, evidence based teaching. Our physics department has been using physics education research as a foundation for all of its work. Okay. And that is something that we're really proud of because it works and it actually gets uh, students saying very well prepared. I just want to add. Uh, at Mount Sac, um, every seven years, a uh, full-time faculty is eligible to apply for sabbatical. My colleagues have uh, have applied and have done research as their sabbatical project. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so before we move on into our kind of open Q&A session where we can answer some more of the questions, the awesome questions that have come up in the chat, um, just very quickly, uh, I wonder from the panelists, if each of you could speak a little on what kind of preparation or training would you recommend to new faculty or graduate students or future faculty that would prepare them to teach at community college? I think all of us could probably add something. Um, I would say um, if you have a community college near you and, and you could go to the department chair of the field that you're in and just talk to, you know, see if you can get an appointment with one of the professors in that, in that department and, and ask to be invited, you know, ask if you can come in and sit in in the class and watch them teach and do a variety of that kind of thing. Um, be aware of what kind of teaching is being done. Take a look around, be aware of the students around the room. Contact HR, HR look a little bit at um, what it takes to get a job there and kind of uh, jump through those hoops. And I just want to congratulate you all. Being here today is, I would say, a really fantastic um, start. Uh, CERTL, Aspire, we are really here to help you help students in the future. I just want to add uh, just what, what Kathy said. Yes, this is a great start uh, to learn more about teaching community college. And definitely, if there is a community college close to where you are, uh, reach out to that department chair or dean of the, the division and ask if there's potential job shadowing. Um, I know our faculty would welcome any uh, anyone to come and say, hey, you know, can I observe or can I help in some way? Um, we don't have a formal sh job shadowing program, but we can probably uh, discuss something um, on an informal level. Unfortunately, there's no fund, so it would have to be voluntary, but uh, it will give you a good um, insight as to what it takes and what life is like and you know what it involves. Um, I for one would like to volunteer if you're if any of you out there are close to Walnut uh, in East LA County, um, look me up, send me an email. I'll be happy to uh, discuss more with you at uh, perhaps you know doing a job shadowing at Mount Sac, not necessarily in anatomy with me, but it could be with my other colleagues in biology. Yes, this is echoing. Uh, this is a lot of uh, this is what said. Um, I will add that in California, um, it says this is specifically for uh, this is California. We actually have a pedagogy and teaching. It says a uh, work that's done uh, organization that works with all of our community colleges called the uh, California Community Colleges Success Network, or more succinctly, it is just referred to as 3CSN. 
and they offer a lot of programs on kinds of teaching as well and so one of the nice things about them is that they actually have formal internships like we have something that we uh, that they do this is called um this is a project match which is a, this is a way of doing uh internships so uh, if there are professional development organizations in your state then that would be something definitely to search out through uh, also don't be afraid to search out i think for uh, this is like not just the reach talks at a professional organization like the american astronomical society or um, it says uh, it says yeah, going to it says your other types of professional societies is that there will be to side talks on how to do teaching and says how to deal with uh, it says, uh, things in the classroom other preparations so forth so contact those professional societies as well great thank you and I, I'd like to do a little plug also for us in in Southern California or if you're in the LA region um, we also have a openings for an Aspire internship that partners with Project Match. And so if that's something that maybe is interested, uh, interests you, feel free to shoot me an email also, um, and I can give you more information on all of that. Um, so again, right before we move on, any resources that you might want to share, um, maybe we could send later. Uh, so just to kind of think about it, is there anything that's on the top of your head that you can think might be useful? It's okay if not. This to add in, there's a lot of excellent books that are, that are out that, that are very science based. Um, I think this is one of them is, I believe it's Reading in the Brain. This is uh, by Dehain. Uh, it says, uh, it's a great look on how the brain processes information. And you can actually think about and see the implications that has for teaching. Uh, so it says, uh, that is something that says I really like as a professional, but there's lots of uh, publications that are put out um, right now. I'm reading culturally, respond to, uh, culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. And it says uh, trying to figure out what are just effective evidence-based ways to get out there. So there's lots of actually things you can find on this is uh, Amazon and so forth. It says that will can actually sort of help you on your own time to help prepare you for ways of reaching out to different groups. I've actually read Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain and it's awesome, so I highly recommend. Um, okay, so Jess, why don't you take it over and talk a bit about um, some of the questions that came up in the chat. Sure, and I just want to add um, one uh, kind of resource thing to mention. Um, if you are actively pursuing uh, a job opportunities and teaching at a community college is that a good idea is just kind of to learn what some of the initiatives are that are happening um, in your in your state or in your region. So, for example, in California, there's a lot of initiatives happening around um, math preparedness. There's the AB 705, I think is the the correct number um, of uh, removing uh, rem remedial courses. So, I, I think in addition to just kind of learning about uh, the the setting as a whole and inclusive teaching practices and culturally responsive teaching and all of all of those topics which are super important there's also some uh, homework you can do kind of regionally to look into what's happening um, in your own district where you're applying uh, so that you are prepared to speak to that in your in your application materials and during an interview as well so that's a different kind of resource but I wanted to mention that um, there's a question that I don't think got addressed yet about um, what are ways in which faculty are evaluated in terms of tenure and promotion. Um, what does that process look like? How competitive is it? How might it compare to a four-year institution? Um, is there somebody that, that can speak to that? Are we all being polite? <laughs> Kathy, why don't you jump in? OK. Um, you know, uh, for, for us, uh, once you get hired, you know, once you've gone through the very, I remember they told me this when I first got hired, once you go through the very rigorous hiring, you know, and you get that job, whoa, um, you, you're going to be evaluated. But it's, at my institution, it's not that, it's not competitive. It's, it's, you jump through the hoops, you do everything you're supposed to do, and you really have to mess up to not 
keep that job. We don't have tenure, but we have a three-year contract thing. And, and, and really, I've seen people quit, but I have very seldom seen anybody, very seldom, I've never seen anybody fired uh, for not doing the job. Uh, I think that's because the people they, they screen and they finally hire are, are usually really excited about teaching at a community college. I have seen different situations in different colleges. So that is a very important and valid question to ask. The uh, evaluation um, would include you writing up your plan for the future, you sitting, uh, you somebody sitting in your classroom and evaluating um, based on whatever uh, criteria your school has. Oftentimes it's, it's um, um, are you, you know, are you having a student-centered classroom, you know, that kind of thing. So you want to um, address all those things in your teaching. And if you have a good dean, or advisor, or department, or whatever, or mentor, they will guide you through improvements. And you'll go through that every year. Um, like I said, we don't have the research base, so you don't have to you know, publish or perish, so to speak. But it is important to validate the things you're doing and keep track of your time and, you know, keep student evaluations, you'll get student evaluations. And then keep in mind when you get your student evaluations, if you're not getting at least a few bad ones, you know, I mean, I, I shouldn't say, don't let the bad ones get to you, you know. Um, focus on, on the good ones and take the, the ones that are more negative as, okay, how could I have helped, help this stu student a little differently? Um, but don't take it as a negative, I'm a bad person kind of thing. I speak from experience. Thanks, Kathy. Um, there is a question that often comes up in these webinars uh, that I can speak to if, if uh, no one else is quite sure. But there's often questions about people who are uh, international graduate students or um, seeking a work permit. Uh, how difficult is, is it for them to obtain a full-time position at a community college? Um, I'll say that my understanding of that is that it, it can be more challenging uh, because it is uh, certainly easier for the college to hire somebody with has a valid work, work permit or is able to um, work without any additional support, but that there are um, both certain subject areas and then certain areas of the country where there really is a high need. It's really challenging to find people to fill those positions and that those are, would be the areas to target. So that's kind of the information I've gotten in the past. Does anybody have um, any anything to add to that or anything different from what I've said in terms of applicants that are uh, from an international background and might need support with uh, the work status? Um, I don't have anything to add to the international background, but can I go back to the last questions about evaluations? Um, okay, so I'm going to break it up in terms of for uh, part times. Okay, if the faculty is part time, then at MouseSAC we have mandatory student evaluation and classroom visit, especially the first time the person is teaching that class. Um, for a full time tenure tracked candidate is more rigorous. Um, first of all, there will be classroom visit for every single prep, every single different class that the person's teaching. There will also be student evaluation in every class. Um, and also uh, there is a portfolio, in which case the, the, the first time or the, the new faculty member will have to give samples of his or her work that includes uh, lecture notes, uh, PowerPoint slides, includes copies of homework, copies of quizzes, um, sample exam questions. And we have a committee that will evaluate the portfolio and give feedback. The goal is not to uh, not rehire. The goal is to help that person improve with every year so that at the end of the fourth year, the committee will make the recommendation of tenureship. So, um, so our system, our process is, is may sound uh, strict, but is really meant to help the um, the the full time person become tenured. 
Um, and then once you're tenured, then it's uh, pretty relaxed. We have a three-year cycle where the first year we do student evaluation. The second year, we, uh, we invite someone to come to our class to do observation. And third year is sort of like a, a cumulative self-reflection of what happened in the first two years. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Lonnie, for that additional context. Um, there's There are some specific questions coming up about um, is so a couple of people I think have asked if you have TA experience as a PhD student, is that enough to make you kind of competitive for a full time position in a community college specifically? And I'll add to that if that's all you have, how might you try to spin that? Um, Dale, do you want to speak to that one? I certainly can because I am the massive, massive outlier, it says, when it comes to a lot of this. I was actually hired into my full-time position without part-time experience. And that was that is rare. Uh, it says, and so the reason why I was able to get into that is because I actually sought out it says, some experience, both formal and in uh, fun, well, mostly informal, but it says, uh, a little bit formal, of what I want to do. This is says, people care about this is uh, your intent. They want to see if you're interested in the position for the actual position. So having a little bit of experience, whether it's informal, like it being a it being a student tutor getting a sense of you can talk to other people and says and can communicate because it says we're dealing a lot with people who are underprepared for college we need to be able to diagnose and work with them on how the, they're able to understand this so having some TA experience this is a it says I think would set you apart from someone that has no experience and so it says, uh, but say about that it says why you did that is that something you had to do is it something that you asked for this is uh, if uh, you've got a chance you'll have a chance to do teaching philosophy and we'll talk about uh, they'll be talking about this next time but it says really get into it says what you learn from it what you think that can help you deal with your it says uh, your ability to teach and connect with students thanks Dale um, I'm, I know we are, are getting close to the end here. We have about less than 10 minutes left. Um, let me see. One question that I know was earlier on. Well, OK, I'm trying to pick the best question here. Um, OK, so I think that a couple of people are asking questions about, like, is this enough? Is this enough for me to be competitive? There's a question about um, if you have high school teaching experience, um, is that valuable? Uh, if you only have a master's, is it as valuable as or as competitive as somebody who has a PhD? Um, those types of questions. So maybe um, kind of more generally speaking to, you know, when maybe I can rephrase as when a hiring committee is posting a search and looking for a candidate. Um, what, in terms of the, the qualifications, what is the balance between kind of a more elite uh, background in terms of a research institution or D versus somebody who maybe has a master's and then also has um, other relevant teaching experiences that they're bringing to the table? Um, Kathy, did you want to speak to that? I see your mic. Yeah. On. Yeah, I put my mic on because I'm I, my my position is being um, filled as we speak. They're e evaluating the hundred or so applications that came in, and obviously I don't know anything about it. I you know I'm not allowed to know anything about it, um, but I do coach a lot of people into um, getting you know getting the uh, application in, getting it to the point of being able to actually being asked to. What they'll do is you, they'll narrow it down, and then they'll send you a list of questions to answer. And I guess I want my my thing is always go go to your heart, be be in your heart. If you answer the questions from your heart and fill out the applications honestly, and as Dale said, if your intent is really you just really want to help that next generation, that that those students 
get to their next step and that's really in your heart, it will come through in everything you do. But be honest, when you fill out the application and write your cover letter, that's crucial. In your cover letter, do not say, I'm looking for a, a, a job where I can do a lot of research. Well, that's not going to go over big at a community college. Uh, do your homework. Research that community college. Find their mission statement. In your cover letter, say something about the college's mission statement, but only if it really resonates with you. And then when you go into interview, um, I know this is going to sound silly, but review the basics of your, your class. Get a high school chemistry book or a high school biology book. Um, know the basics. Understand, answer, like in chemistry, understand how to answer uh, a Lewis structure question, which, you know, you, oh, I did that way back a long time ago. Yeah, but that's what we want you to teach. So address it not as if it's, um, oh gosh, that's so easy, but address it in the aspect of, oh, well, here's how I would set it up. And oftentimes you'll also be asked to do a teaching demonstration. When you go to do the teaching demonstration in an interview, you want to say, this is what we covered this week. This is what your background is. I'm going to start here and then go on from there. So make sure you let the people know where they're at and then try to teach them one thing. And if you can get somebody in, for example, in the English department who might be sitting on your thing to learn something about chemistry and kind of walk away going, yeah, I kind of like learning that topic that I never thought I was interested in. That's a, that's a plus as well. So you can get in. You don't have to have that PhD from that elitist university, although it may get you an interview or a set of questions. You don't need to have that. You can have a master's degree and passion, and that will get you a long way. Dale, Lonnie, anything to add? So sure, it says, by now, being department chair, as well as I've served on a variety of hiring committees and so forth, and I, it says, first of all, just echo, it says all those things that Kathy said. And so what we will typically do is, is yeah, it says we have to look for people who will officially meet the qualifications. We meet and then we talk about which of those people are, this is within our, um, this is a, this is uh, we think are the, going to be the most likely it says uh, to it says help out uh, it says our college and our it says the style that our government our department is trying to do and because by the way and this is a uh, specifically for our district but we're actually required to have at least one or two it says of our final interviews be with uh, adjunct instructors uh, this is with our it's a district and so it says uh, when looking at who's teaching it says there can be teaching experience that can be a benefit but again it says it can be what is your passion does your passion link you to this through your teaching philosophy through your cover letter is uh, it says really push for that and honestly it's you know uh, like i've seen a variety of links like for example the uh, the recent link to the uh, newsletter and so forth and it says that is a says a, it says get some a little bit of teaching pedagogy. I mean, in specifically in STEM, I feel that you're that you don't need to have as much experience. This is a before people can might hire you as you would, for example, I don't know, in history or English or something like that. So it says a, it says declare your intent. It says my college uh, faculty on my hiring committee were actually nervous that I was just going to for a job while I hunted for something with research and so I told uh, my teaching demonstration was all about the joy of teaching and so it says they told me what I had what kind of teaching demo um, topic I had but then left it at that and I could decide where I wanted to take it so I focused my teaching demo on how all these different things connected together like the black body curve links to all these other topics in astronomy and ties them all together and so that was the focus of mine is how to wrap up how to this is a, connect the dots and so find the part of it that interests you this is a, and explain that and when if you have 
joy in your teaching, if you want to, if you ex are happy to actually be up there, that does come through and people see that. And it says uh, that gets rewarded, I think, it says in these hiring committees. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I We're out of time, unfortunately, and we'd love to hear so much more. Um, so I want to thank so much our panelists that were here, Dale, Kathy, and Lonnie. You are all so wonderful. Um, they agreed to share their information with you all, and so here is kind of their information. If you have any questions for me or Jess or even Kate, um, please email us. Please take a look at the links that we've shared in the uh, chat boxes. And um, I'd like to thank you all for participating here. You've been so wonderful. So many great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them today, but I, I'd love to thank you so much for everything. And good luck with your job hunt, too. Um, we hope to see you in February and again in March. Um, please join us again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if the panelists can stick around for just a couple minutes, we can just um, debrief in a little breakout room. But thank you, everybody. <laughs>